Hello everyone, welcome to my channel Nerdy Coder. If you're the first time seeing my video, please give me a like and subscribe and share this video with others. This will give me more motivation to create new videos for you. In today's video, we will learn how to use React for front end development. I will show you how to create a simple calculator web app with React and TypeScript from scratch. This is a calculator web app which we will be creating in this video. You can perform simple calculations using your mouse to interact with the web app. You can also use your keyboard to type in the numbers to make a calculation. There is a menu bar on the top, which you can navigate to a different screen to see the calculation history. By creating this very simple calculator app, you will understand 80% of React concepts, which you will be using on a daily basis. If you are starting a new project, you will likely use a scaffolding tool such as V or a React framework such as Next.js. These tools will create a skeleton with some code already generated for you. This is often the preferred way to start a new project. However, if you are new to React, you may be confused with why the code is written in certain ways. For the purpose of learning, I will be creating this React application from scratch. By creating it from scratch, you will have a better understanding of how React works. React is a free and open source front-end JavaScript library for building user interfaces based on components. Before you learn React, it is very helpful to have a basic understanding of HTML, CSS, and JavaScript. I'm not using any UI framework in this React app, and I will keep the CSS to the very basic, because I want you to focus on learning React in this video. React helps you to build functional web app, but if you want your website to look beautiful, then you have to learn CSS. Before I start coding, I'm going to go through several important topics which will help you understand and learn React. I'm going to talk about what makes front-end development so different than back-end API development, what problems React solves in front-end development, and how React works. If you just want to start coding, feel free to skip ahead. I highly recommend you to follow along with me. In a web application, front end is the user interface and presentation layer. It presents information to the end user and receives user input. Back end is the application layer and contains business logic. Both front end and back end development involve handling users' inputs, but the way how you handle users' input are drastically different. When you are developing a back end API, you are setting up a server. Most of the time, this server will listen to one and only one port. You can consider this as a one way in, one way out. When traffic in the form of HTTP request arrives to your server in this particular port, you inspect the content of the HTTP request, process the request according to your business logic, and then send back a response to the client. The semantics of a HTTP request is standardized, and you can enforce it through an API contract, so you can expect what information you will get from this request. When you're developing a front end, most of the time, you will allow users to interact with the front end. Your front end will then respond by displaying different information depending on what actions a user has taken. Within a two-dimensional space of a front end, a user could take any action at any location or UI elements you display on the front end. For example, a user may be typing some text in a text box, clicking a button, selecting a checkbox. Each action a user performs will generate some kind of events. It could be key down and key up events when a user is pressing a key in the keyboard. It could be a mouse or scroll event when the user is moving or scrolling with the mouse. It could be a click event when the user clicks on a button, or change event when the user is changing text in the text box. Since you cannot predict where and when a user may take actions, and what actions a user may take, using event listeners is critical in front-end development. You will be registering event listeners on different UI elements to respond to different events generated by user actions. Registering an event listener 
means telling the front end what function to execute when a particular event is generated from this element. For example, you could tell the front end to execute callback function A when a change event is generated from the text box, and to execute callback function B when a click event is generated from the button. The same callback function could perform different actions depending on the current state of data. For example, function B may make an API call if some text is provided in the text box when a user clicks the button. If the user has not typed anything in the text box before a user clicks on the button, function B may cause an error message to be displayed instead. It is your responsibility to create these callback functions in event listeners and register them appropriately to different UI elements in order to create a useful and meaningful front end. As you can see in front end development, you need to understand what actions a user could perform on each UI element, what events could be generated from this UI element as a result of these actions, and know how to manipulate the front end to display different information in response to these user actions. This is the same whether you're developing a desktop application's front end, a website's front end, or a mobile app's front end. React is a front end JavaScript library which helps developers develop front ends easier and faster. It solves several problems which developers face when creating front end with pure HTML and JavaScript. With React, you can write declarative code instead of imperative code. This means that you can tell React what you want to show and happen in the user interface, and React will figure out the steps to update the user interface and display information on your behalf. With HTML and JavaScript, it is not very straightforward and easy to create reusable UI components. But in React, you can create reusable components easily. React also provides tools and mechanisms to help you manage state. If you haven't heard the term state, you can consider state as a set of variables or data which changes in value as the user interacts with your UI. The state could have different values at different points in time, and your UI changes as the state changes. To illustrate these three points, I'm going to show you a very simple example of creating UI components with pure HTML and JavaScript versus using React. I'm going to create a barebone HTML document. I have the header with a title and then a body. In the body, I will create a div. Inside this div, I'm going to have a button and a description for the button. Every time I click the button, I'm going to make the counter both inside the button and in the description to increment by one. Since you can't write JavaScript inside HTML tags, I'm going to create some JavaScript code in the script section. I will add the event listener to the button element so that every time I click the button, I will increment both counters by one. Also, since I can reference the count variable inside the HTML tags, in order to update this zero here, I will have to wrap this zero into a different HTML tag and then update it separately like so. And now the button will work as what we expected. This is also an example of writing imperative code. You are using JavaScript to control step by step on how this counter element is to be updated. We are replacing the inner HTML element of this span element with the value of the count variable every time we click this button. It doesn't seem to be too bad for this simple example. Imagine a situation which you need to reuse this button in another location with the same exact behavior. You cannot save these HTML elements as a variable and reference them somewhere else. Therefore, if you're going to reuse the button again, 
you will have to copy and paste the same HTML elements and repeat the associated JavaScript code. If you have to repeat this 100 times, it will become very tedious and unmanageable. In order to reuse these HTML elements, you have to use JavaScript to create these HTML elements. This will become your reusable HTML elements through JavaScript code. One way to do it is to use an empty div element. In the JavaScript code, you will reference this div element and then you will create a button element with JavaScript. Set any attributes which you need for this button element, create a span element for the counter, and then create the content of the button element. You will repeat similar things for the description. After that, you will add an event listener to increment the count variable every time we click on the button. We will also update the span elements with the value of the count variable. At the end, you will append the button element in the description as children of the div element. To render multiple copies of the button element, you can wrap this around a for loop. In the end, you will have the same outcome as the previous version of using copy and paste. I mentioned earlier about state. The count variable here represents the state of the count button and description. This count variable is one of the many JavaScript statements here, so it may not always be very obvious that this represents the state. Developing frontend with HTML and vanilla JavaScript gives you a lot of control, but it could also become very verbose just to create and reuse HTML components. This is a web page with the same two buttons and descriptions, but created with React. In React, you can use JSX. JSX stands for JavaScript XML. It allows you to write HTML in JavaScript. You can write HTML elements and reference JavaScript variables within HTML elements. No more document.getElementById or document.createElement in JavaScript. This is the event listener for the button click event. In this event listener, we are simply telling we are that this count variable should be incremented by one whenever this button is clicked. And we yet will figure out how to display the updated value of this count variable in the user interface. Also, the state of this button element is defined very explicitly here. To make this button element reusable, we wrap all these HTML elements into a button component. And we can reference this button component from another component and render it multiple times. Developing with React makes it a lot easier and quicker to create UI components compared to using vanilla JavaScript. And it makes your code much more concise. Before we learn how React works, we need to first understand the document object model, or DOM. The document object model is a programming interface for web documents. A web document is represented in a tree structure. In the tree structure, there are a number of nodes, and each node contains objects. Except the node at the end of the tree, each node will have one or more child nodes. In our simple HTML document, the HTML document is the root node. Under document, we have the HTML element. The HTML element has two child nodes, head and body. The head and body elements again have their own child nodes. This goes on until all content of the web page is represented with nodes in this tree structure. Representing the web document in this tree structure allows us to use the DOM standard interfaces to manipulate the web document with JavaScript. We can change the document structure, style, and content. For example, 
We can use the get element by ID method to access an element with a particular ID. Use the elements append method to add another element as its child element. Or update the content of an element by modifying its properties. React is a JavaScript library. React also uses JavaScript and the DOM programming interface to create and manipulate HTML elements in the web document. This is similar to what we did earlier. Instead of directly creating button and P elements using HTML tags, we were using JavaScript to create the button and the P elements. But React allows us to create code in a much concise and declarative way. In order for React to work, we have to designate an HTML element as the root element for React. This is typically a div element under the HTML body, but it could also be any other element among the descendant nodes of the HTML body. When we are writing code in React, we create a tree of React components. At runtime, React will create and update the tree of HTML elements starting from this root node using the DOM programming interface based on the React components we created. However, directly updating the DOM is an expensive operation. Every time the DOM is updated, the browser has to re-render the UI. React has a different approach in updating the DOM. It uses a concept called Virtual DOM. Virtual DOM is a virtual representation of the DOM. Manipulating the Virtual DOM is fast, and the virtual DOM does not get rendered by the browser. Whenever the state of the application is changed, it means the UI needs to be updated. In this case, React will first make a copy of the virtual DOM from the previous state. React will then create a new virtual DOM with the updated state. After that, React will find out which elements have been updated and then find the best possible way to update the virtual DOM. The key takeaway is that whenever the state of the application changes, we have to make the minimal changes to the DOM in order for the UI to show the updated state. To use React for front-end development, you generally don't need to know the inner workings of how React manipulates DOM. I hope now you have a better understanding of how React works. Let's get started on setting up the React project. Before we begin, we need to have Node.js installed in the computer. Node.js is not required to run React in the browser, but we need to have Node.js for development. This will also allow us to use NPM packages to bundle our React code into JavaScript files to run in the browser. I already have Node.js installed in my computer. My Node.js version is 20. Any version of Node.js greater than 16 should be okay for React, but I recommend you to have at least version 18 because version 16 has already reached the end of life. We'll use npm to set up the project. npm is the package manager for JavaScript, and it comes with Node.js. We'll run the command npm init-y to initialize a project. Dash y means to accept the default settings in package.json. The settings are not very critical for our React project. Feel free to customize package.json however you need. We need to install several packages for React. The two packages you need are React and React DOM. We'll run npm install react react dash DOM to install those two packages. Since we are developing in TypeScript, we also need to install several packages related to TypeScript. We will need the TypeScript package as well as the type information related to React and React DOM. We'll run npm install dash dash Save dev TypeScript at types slash react at types slash react dash DOM. Dash dash save dev means that we are saving these three packages as development dependencies. After we have TypeScript installed, we initialize the TypeScript project by running npx tsc dash dash init. npx allows us to run the tsc command which is the TypeScript compiler. This comes with the TypeScript package we just installed. After we run those commands, the package.json 
and the tsconfig.json files should appear in your folder, along with the package log file and the node modules folder. The node modules folder contains all the dependencies you just installed. We don't need to change any configurations in those two JSON files yet, but we'll revisit them later when we need to make modifications. If you remember in my earlier discussion, we need to designate a root node in an HTML document for React to render the components. I will create this document and name it index.html. Inside index.html, I will create a barebone HTML document. I will declare the document type as HTML document. And a minimum, a HTML document requires a HTML tag. Inside the HTML element, I will have two elements, the head element and the body element. Inside the header, we will have the title of the application. Inside the body, we will have a div element. I will give this div element an ID of root so that I can reference this div element later in JavaScript by ID. The ID doesn't have to call root. You can use any valid HTML attribute value for the ID. This div element will become the root node for React. We also create a script session to run the React code. We'll reference the source file, which we are going to create. We'll go back and update the reference to the source file once we have the file created. React doesn't require a particular file or folder structure, so we can put the source files however we like. To organize the TypeScript files, I will create a folder named SLC and put all my TypeScript files inside. I will create a file named index.tsx. This file will become the entry point of the React code. Normally, a TypeScript file has an extension of TS. Using extension of TSX allows us to write HTML in React with JSX. While using JSX is not required for React, it makes it a lot easier to create React components with JSX. Almost all React examples that you see are written with JSX. This is an example code written with JSX. It resembles the format of HTML. If you don't like to use JSX, you can use the create element method as the alternative. This is a sample to use React with the create element method. This is equivalent to the example code we just saw. It looks very cumbersome, so I highly recommend that you use JSX in React if possible. To designate a root node for React, we can use the create root method from React. This is the documentation on the create root method. To use it, we have to first select the DOM node through the DOM programming interface, and then provide this DOM node as an argument to the create root method. We will then call the random method of the created root, and then provide a React component as the argument. The app here is a React component. This is also the root of the React component tree. Let's go back to our code and create this React root. We will import the create root method from the React DOM library. This is the div element we need to reference. It has an ID of root. I will access the div element here by using the get element by ID method of the HTML document. I will then pass in this node as the argument for the create root method. There's a type error here because get element by ID could return null, and the argument to the create root method cannot be null. Since we know an element with ID of root exists, we will cast the DOM node to a type of HTML element. I will call the random method and pass in the first React component. We don't have any React component yet, so we put a placeholder here first. I will create React component next, and then come back to change it later. The div element here looks like an HTML tag, but it is actually a JSX tag. I will explain more about it next. You will also see another type error here. It says cannot use JSX unless the JSX flag is provided. This is a TypeScript error. To fix it, we have to go to the tsconfig.json file and enable JSX. 
we'll use the value of preserve so that the emitted JavaScript file will maintain the JSX syntax. Now the type error goes away. There are other options for JSX. If you want to compile files to use the react.create element syntax, you can set JSX with a value of react. I will use a value of preserve in my code. For the first React component, I will create a file named app.tsx in React. We typically name the file the same as the name of the React component, although you don't have to name it that way. The name of a React component must start with a capitalized letter. Therefore, we typically use Pascal case for React component names. There are two ways to define React components. We can define React component as functions or using JavaScript class. A React class component looks something like this. As you can see in the React documentation, class components are still supported by React, but React doesn't recommend using them in new code. Using functional components is the recommended approach. We will stick with functional components. A functional component, as its name implies, is just a function. To make it a React component, you need to capitalize the first letter of the function name and return a JSX element, such as a H1 element. Although it looks like an HTML tag, this is actually a JSX tag. JSX stands for JavaScript XML. JSX tags are similar to HTML tags, but there are some important differences. One difference is that every JSX tag must be closed such as this. While in HTML, you don't necessarily have to close every tag, and the tag BR without a closing tag is valid in HTML. We'll go through JSX in more details in the rest of this video. For now, we'll only include a simple message. Another important thing to mention is that you cannot return multiple JSX tags. One way to overcome that is to wrap them around a shared parent, such as a div element, or use an empty wrapper, like so. We'll export this function as the default export. Since this React component is just a function, you can also use named export. We can also export multiple React components from the same file, but typically we export one React component per file and use the export default keyword to specify the main component in the file. We just created the first React component. We'll go back to the index.tsx file and import this app React component we just created and use it as the root React component. We'll also update the reference to the source file in index.html. We have just created a very basic React app, but before we can run this React app in the browser, we need to build our code first. The goal of the build step is to optimize the delivery of HTML, CSS, and JavaScript files to users through the browser, minimizing both the number of files and the total file size. A build step typically performs one or more of the following activities. Bundling. Bundling combines all required dependencies into one or a few JavaScript files. Tree shaking. Tree shaking eliminates that code in production build in both the dependencies and the source code that you write. Minification. Minification removes code comments, white spaces, unused code, and shorten variable and function names. Compiling. Compiling converts TypeScript code into JavaScript code and converts JavaScript to lower version of JavaScript and converts syntax to support older browsers. This is often used in conjunction with polyfill. If you're using SAS for style sheets, it will also convert SAS to CSS. Polyfill. Polyfill is a piece of code used to implement a JavaScript feature on older browsers that do not natively support it. One popular library for Polyfill is the core JS library. We have installed a number of dependencies so far. If you check the size of the node modules folder, there are about 38 megabytes of files. This is a lot of dependencies, just to show the two lines of messages. We wouldn't want users to download all these files just for a simple web page. 
Also, we probably only use a very small subset of functions from these dependencies. The build step will help extract only the functions we used into the bundled JavaScript files. One popular build tool is Webpack. However, in this video, I'm going to use a tool called Vit. Vit requires very minimal configuration. This will allow us to get started very quickly. The current version of Vit is version 5. Vit version 5 requires Node.js version 18 or higher. We can use Vit to scaffold a React app, but since we already have our React app, we will set up Vit from scratch. To use Vit to build our code, we need to set up a few things. Vit requires the index.html file to be placed in the project wood. We already have this file, but Vit requires the script tag to include type equals module. This will declare our JavaScript code as using the JavaScript module syntax. We will update our index.html file to reflect this. We will be able to locate our TypeScript file based on the value of the source attribute. We provide a CLI to run a development server, create a production build, and preview the production build locally. We will set up our npm scripts in package.json file so that we can run the Vit CLI more conveniently. For Vit to work with React, we also need to install the Vit React plugin and configure the plugin in the vit.config.js file. These are the three simple things we need to configure in order to use Vit to build our code. We will first install Vit and the Vit React plugin. We will run npm install dash dash save dev vit at vit.js slash plugin dash react. To install vit and the vit react plugin as development dependencies. We will then set up the vit.config.js file to use the vit react plugin. I will copy the basic vit config from the GitHub readme. We will also update the index.html file to include the type equals module in the script tag. I also set up the npm scripts. I will copy the vit commands from the vit documentation. To create production build, we can run npm run build, which will in turn run vit build. This is giving you a deprecation warning, saying that the CJS CommonJS build of vit is deprecated. To fix it, we can set our npm project to use ES module syntax instead of CommonJS. If you go to this link, it will tell you to set type module in your package.json file in order to use the ES module syntax. We update our package.json file and create a production build again. Now there's no more deprecation warning. The production build is located in the folder named DIST. There are two files generated, a HTML file and a JavaScript file. These are all the files you need to render the entire website with React. In the HTML file, the value of the source attribute in the script tag is updated to point to the generated JavaScript file. The JavaScript file contains the bundled, tree shaped compiled, and minified JavaScript code. This is not human readable, but contains your source code and all the dependencies used in your source code with all the dead code eliminated. This is also much smaller than the 38 megabyte of dependencies in your no modules folder. To serve the production build, we can run npm run preview, which will in turn run read preview. For local development, we will run npm run dev, which will in turn run read without any argument. In development mode, read monitors if any source code is modified and will automatically reload the page when there are changes. Another tool which will be very helpful for React development is the React Developer Tool browser extension. It is available for Edge, Chrome, and Firefox browsers. I already installed in my browser. To open the React Developer Tool, 
You can open the browser's developer tool first. You can access the developer tool from the browser's menu or through a keyboard shortcut. In my browser, I can press F12 to open the developer tool. You can then click on More Tools to access the React Developer Tool. Here you will see the React components shown on this page. They already give you a warning saying that this component is not running in strict mode. You can click into it and learn more about it. It says strict mode lets you find common bugs in your components early during development. Strict mode only affects development with strict mode enabled. React will render your components in extra time during development to see if your components have any side effects. It is recommended to enable strict mode for the entire app, so we will do it. And now the warning goes away. We now have all the tools we need for front-end development with React. Before we begin developing any front-end UI, one step which is optional, but I highly recommend, especially for people new to front-end development, is to first create a wireframe. A wireframe is a mockup of how a UI looks like. You can use any tool to create this mockup. Some people draw it by hand on a piece of paper. Some people use PowerPoint. There are specialized tools made for creating wireframes. One popular tool is Figma. Figma allows you to collaborate with others. Here I'm using a tool called Pencil. Pencil is an open source tool and you can run it locally on your PC. I will include links to these tools in the description below. This is how Pencil looks like. I already created two pages and a menu header for the calculator UI. There's a menu on the top. The calculator page allows users to create a calculation, and the history page allows users to see the history of calculations made. You can export this to a web page and share with others. Before we start coding for front end, one of the first exercises we need to do is to decompose the entire front end application into smaller and manageable components. Wireframes are helpful to communicate your UI design to others, but they are also helpful for us to visualize how we can decompose the application. It is a lot easier to create smaller and reusable components than to create one very large and complex component. You can quickly realize that we can at least break it down into three main components, the calculator page, the history page, and the menu header. The header remains the same across both the calculator and the history pages. You can further break them down into smaller components. In the calculator page, we have the calculator body, which is the shader area. Inside that, we have the display and then a number of different calculator buttons. In the history page, we have a list of history card, which is the shader area. Inside them, we have the text indicating the time the calculation was made and the calculation formula and result. We can get deeper and further decompose them. Each text could also be a component. There's no way around how deep you need to get in decomposing the components, but we won't get too far on this in this video. This is a component tree we just discussed. The app component represents the entire calculator app, which is the root component for our React app. We already created this component earlier. Under the app component, with the menu header, calculator and history trial components. Under the calculator component, we have the display and a number of button components. The history component has a list of history cards. React is an unopinionated library. It doesn't detect how you should compose your application nor require certain folder or file structures. By creating a component tree like this, it gives you a rough idea on how you could structure your files and components. Let's go back to our code and start coding. We already have the app component created earlier under the source folder. I'm going to create two folders. One folder is named components and the other one is named layouts. Both folders will contain React components. The layout folder will contain the higher level components in the component tree, which are the ones directly under the app root component. The menu, the calculator and the history components. 
the component folder will contain other smaller reusable components. This is how I like to organize the React component files. There are really no difference on the components under these two folders. They are all React components. You can use one folder or no folder to organize your React components, and you can use any folder names. Inside the layout folder, I will create a manual calculator and the history components. Similar to the app.tsx file for the app component, the file names were end with a .tsx extension so that I could use JSX in creating these components. As I mentioned earlier, a React component is simply a function with a capitalized name, and it should return a JSX element. I will return a div element with some placeholder tags for now for these three components and export them as default export. Since React components are simply JavaScript functions, you can import and export them. To use these three components as the app components children, we can simply import them into the app.tsx file and use them as JSX tags. The custom components use capitalized names to differentiate from the built-in components like the div component. You can see that the contents of these three components are rendered on the browser. This divides the entire application into three main components, and we can work on each of them individually to make them look like our wireframes. Let's start with the manual component. The manual component has a calculator and a history link. The most naive way is to create these two links like writing HTML. However, if you're adding a new menu item, you will have to duplicate this A element and the behaviors associated with it. This may not be ideal. In React, if you want to display multiple copies of the same element, you can use an array. Array is a JavaScript concept. Or you can execute JavaScript code within JSX by wrapping your JavaScript code in curly brackets. However, your JavaScript code inside the curly brackets must be a value, a variable, or an expression which evaluates to a value. We can use an array as the value. One requirement of using an array is that you must provide a unique key to each element in the array. This allows React to efficiently re-render the DOM whenever the element associated with a certain key is updated. You don't have to construct this array manually. You can use the JavaScript map functions here to construct this array. For example, if you have an array of menu item names, I can create an array like this. We can also use the curly brackets to set the attribute values with JavaScript value, variables, or expression like I do for the key attribute here. With this setup, we can easily add or remove a menu item by changing this array of strings. I'm going to do some refactoring here. I'm going to use an enum for the menu item names. Install the array of menu items in a variable outside this function. React components are JavaScript functions. We can pass data into React components as function arguments. React components accept one argument to allow you to pass data into the components. We call this argument props. This props is a JavaScript object. This object can have any properties which are defined by us. In our menu component, we can pass in a list of menu items in the props. This will make our menu component more reusable because we can pass in different lists of menu items and this component will render them accordingly. It won't be limited to the calculator and history items defined in this component. We can use a property name of menu items in the props and the value is a list of menu item. You can directly use the props in your component. 
this structure at the top of this function implementation. But a more common approach is to destructure the props in the function signature. Destructuring function argument in the signature is a JavaScript or TypeScript concept, and it's not unique to React. But you see this very often in many React projects. To pass data into this component, you will set the attributes of this component with the same name as the property key you define in the props. In this case, this will be menu items. As I mentioned earlier, you can use curly brackets to pass in the value of array. There's a reserved property named children in the props. This children property has a type of React node. A React node is one or more React elements, JSX elements, strings, booleans, or numbers. The intention of this children property is for your component to render these components as child nodes. To pass in children elements to the menu component, we simply put them as child nodes of the menu component like so. We won't be needing this children property in the menu component, but we will probably need it in other components of this calculator app. If you remember in our wireframes, when we click on the calculator link, it shows the calculator component and the history component is hidden. If we click on the history link, the history component is shown but the calculator component is not. To do this, we need conditional rendering. In React, there's no special syntax for conditional rendering. Instead, we rely on JavaScript's conditional statements, which is the if else if statements or switch statements. We'll create a variable to store the selected item and a variable for the rendered element. We'll then set the value of the rendered element based on a condition. and reference it in the returned JSX element. You can see that the calculated component is rendered. If we change the selected item to history, the history component is rendered instead. This will work and is totally valid. However, if you have simple conditions like this, a common approach is to use the JavaScript's conditional operator, which is the one with a question mark and a colon. We can directly include the condition in JSX like so. If we click on the link in the UI, nothing will change. As I mentioned earlier in the video, in order to make your UI interactive, you need to attach event listeners to your UI elements. When we click on the links, the link will generate a click event. We need to capture this click event and execute some JavaScript code to update the selected item depending on which link is clicked by the user. You may have realized that the variable that we need to update, which is the selected item variable, is in this app component, but the link elements are inside the menu component. To update variables in the parent component, but attach event listeners in the child component. A common approach is to define the callback function in the parent element and then pass in this callback function in the props to the child component. In the child component, we attach event listeners to the link elements and execute this callback function. We will start with the menu component. We will call this callback function on click. This callback function takes a menu item and returns nothing. To add an event listener, we need to add an attribute to the JSX element. The attribute name starts with the word on, followed by the event name in camel case. In this case, it will be on click. On click takes a callback function. Callback functions for DOM events typically have one or more arguments, and the first argument is typically the event object, but it could vary. In our case, our callback function doesn't rely on the event object. We'll create a lambda function. This lambda function will execute the onClick callback function passed in in the props with the menu item. I'm using optional chaining here in the onClick function, which is the question mark and a dot. This is the JavaScript operator. It means that if this onClick function is undefined, 
it will return undefined and do nothing. Otherwise, we will execute this onClick function with the menu item as the argument. We will then define the onClick callback function in the app component. I will call it handle menu selection. This function will update the variable selected item. This will not work as what you expect it to do. I will show you in a minute, but for now, I will keep it like this. I will then pass in this handle menu selection callback function to the menu component. If you try to click on the links, still nothing is changing. You can add a console log statement to make sure that this callback function is executed when we click on the link. The reason for this is that when you update a JavaScript variable like this, React doesn't know you have updated a variable and doesn't know that the UI needs to be updated. So React will do nothing to update your UI. We call this selected item variable a state of your application. This state changes as a user interacts with your UI, and the UI needs to be updated depending on the value of this variable. React provides a mechanism for you to define your application state. It is called a use state hook. By using the use state hook for your state variable, React is aware of state changes and will automatically update the UI for you when a state changes. UState is a function. It is a generic function in TypeScript. If you're using TypeScript, you can provide type information for your state using generics like so. This UState function takes an optional argument, which is the initial state. UState returns an array. This array has two elements. The first element is your current state, which is a read-only variable. The second element is a function, which you can call to update your state. We call this the set function. Whenever you use this set function to update your state, React will re-render your component. You can name this set function however you like, but the convention is to add the word set in front of your state variable and use camel case. It is totally fine to access your state and set function like this, but a common approach is to use array destructuring to assign your state variable and set function. This will make your code more concise. Similar to prop destructuring, array destructuring is a JavaScript concept and it's not limited to React. We update the onClick callback function to use the set function to update the state variable. The set function takes one argument. You have two options here. Option one is to provide the updated state. Option two is to provide a function. If you're using a function, this function will have the previous state as the only function argument, and it should return the updated state. We're using option one here, and the UI should work as we expected. There are two caveats we need to pay attention to. The first one is that the set function does not immediately update the state variable. If we print out the state variable immediately after we call the set function, it will always print out the old value. The set function triggers a re-render of this component. The updated state variable is only reflected in the re-rendered component. This re-render happens sometime in the future. Another caveat is that when we add re-renders the component, it will execute all your JavaScript statements again, except we have built in hooks, like the use state hook, and return an updated JSX element. This means that the handle menu selection function will be recreated with the same name. If we define any variables here, they will be redefined again. If we execute any functions here, they will be re-executed again when this component will renders. So we always have to be thinking, if we want our functions and variables to be recreated and functions to be re-executed during re-rendering. If our functions and variables are recreated, and functions we executed during re-rendering, would it cause any issues? Besides the use state hook, React provides other hooks for different use cases. We will cover some of those in the remaining of this video. The menu header is now functional, but it doesn't quite look like the menu in the wireframes yet. We will add styling with CSS towards the end, and it will look much better. For now, we focus on creating the functionality we need with React. Next, 
we'll work on the calculator component. If you remember our React component tree, the calculator component contains a display component and a number of button components. Let's create a display component and the button component with some placeholder messages. We we'll import these components into the calculator component. There are two decisions we need to make. The first decision is to decide what states this calculator components contain. As a user clicks on different calculator buttons, the displayed text will change. There are two lines of text. The first line shows the calculation expression and the second line shows the current input or the calculation result once the user hits enter. The UI needs to be re-rendered whenever the calculation expression or the current input changes. Therefore, the calculation expression and the current input becomes the state we need to keep track of in this calculator component. The second decision is to decide where to keep these state variables. There are two possible places to keep these state variables. One place is in the display component, and the other place is in the calculator component. In React, we can pass data and functions from parent components to child components, but not the other way around. If we declare the state in the display component, the set function and the onclick handler function needs to be in the display component as well. However, it's not possible to pass the onclick handler function to the parent calculator component and then pass down to the button component. Therefore, we often need to lift state up. This means declaring state in the parent component and then pass down the state variable and event handle the functions to child components through the component props. We will be declaring two state variables in the calculator component, one for the calculation expression shown on the top and the other one for the current value. The expression state we have an initial state of an empty string, and the current value will have an initial state of a string of zero. The display component will take two values in the props, one for displaying the calculation expression and the one for current value. I will name these secondary and main values. I will include these two values in the returned JSX element. The button component will accept an onclick callback function to handle click events, as well as children elements to render as child nodes for the button's label. I use a React node here instead of a string to make it more flexible in case you want to use an icon as the button's label. For the onclick function, I will use the same function signature as the onclick callback function of the JSX built in button component, and I will forward these props to the built in button component. You may wonder why we don't directly use the built-in button component, but instead we create a custom one. Yes, we could directly use the built-in button component in a calculator component, and it will work just fine. I'm creating a custom button in case I want to customize how this button behaves and look independently in this custom button component, instead of handling the customization in the calculator component. I will then update the display and button components to use these props. And we now have the display and the button shown in the UI. If you remember our wireframes, our calculator has 20 buttons instead of only one button. Having only one button is not very useful for a calculator. Instead of using a map function to create 20 buttons in this calculator component, I can extract this logic to another component and use it here instead. This is similar to breaking a very large function 
into smaller functions, with each having a single responsibility. You don't have to do this, but you usually do it to keep each component small. Real components are simply functions, so it makes it very easy to compose a component. I will name this component keypad and put it in the same file. This keypad component will take only one input in the props, which is a callback function when the key in this keypad has been pressed. This callback function would be called with a string representing what key has been pressed. I'm going to create the 20 keys in the string enum. And then I will create an array of 20 keys from left to right and top to bottom in order. And render these 20 buttons using the map function. It will trigger the callback function whenever a key is pressed. For the callback function, we have two options here. Option one is to create a lambda function for each button, which executes the on key press callback function with the key. We have 20 buttons here, so we will be creating 20 lambda functions. Option two is to set a value for each button with the key as the value and define one callback function. In this callback function, we will extract the value of the button and execute the on key press callback function with this extracted value. I will use option two. I'm going to add another prop called value to the button component. I will also export the button props interface so that I can reference the type information in my handle function and finish up the keypad component. I will then reference the keypad component in the calculator component. I'm creating a dummy event handler function. Whenever I click a button, the value of the button will be printed in the console. To capture user input, the simplest way is to capture every key press from the user as it is and construct the calculation expression. However, this will likely result in many invalid expressions since you cannot mandate a user to press the buttons in a particular order. This will not provide a good user experience. In the UI, we typically perform basic input validations to make sure user inputs are in the proper format. If we have used any calculator app, you will realize that they don't blindly take user inputs. However, implementing a very robust calculator app could be very complicated. For the sake of this tutorial, I'm going to make the following two assumptions to make our work easier. Assumption one is that each calculation only allows two operands, so we don't have to worry about the order of operations. Assumption two is that after each calculation, the user has to clear out the screen before starting another calculation. There are different ways we could implement such a calculator. We could use a bunch of if-then statements to make sure the user inputs are valid. However, I'm going to model the calculator as a state machine. I find this approach the easiest to understand and implement. The calculator will be in different states as the user clicks different buttons. Initially, 
the user will be inputting values for operand 1. As long as the user clicks buttons which only affects the operands, the calculator will stay in the state of operand 1. Once the user clicks any operator buttons, the calculator will move to another state which accepts inputs for operand 2. Operand 2 is initially 0. As long as operand 2 is 0, the user can change the operator. However, as soon as the user clicks on any buttons affecting the operands, the calculator will move to the state of operand 2. The calculator will stay in operand 2 as long as the user only clicks on buttons affecting the operands. If the user clears the entry or click backspace multiple times until operand 2 is 0, the calculator will move back to the state of operand 2 equals 0, which will allow user to change the operator. If the user clicks the equal button or enter, the result will be calculated. In any state, if the user clicks on the C button, the clear button, it will reset the calculator and go back to the initial state, which is at operand 1. This state diagram may look a little bit complicated, but we'll clear things up as we implement it in our code. First, we are going to create the four calculator state constants. We are going to use enum for that. These four calculator states are different than the two we had state variables we declared earlier, the expression and the current variables. The two we had state variables are directly related to the UI updates. If any of these two we had state variables are modified, the UI needs to be re-rendered to show the updated state. However, these four calculator states are only used to handle user input. Any changes to the calculator state do not necessarily mean we need to update the UI. Since the calculated state don't affect the UI, you may attempt to just declare a variable to keep track of the calculated state. But this will not work. If you remember what we said earlier, every time a component is re-rendered, it will re-declare this calculated state variable. So the value of this calculated state variable will always be set to operand 1. To maintain this calculated state between re-renders, one way to do it is to use the useRef react hook. useRef is a function which takes one argument, which is the initial value. This useRef function returns a mutable reference object. This object will persist for the full lifetime of this component and will not be updated or be initialized during re-renders. This reference object has a current property, which contains the initial value, which you can read or write to. You can mutate this reference object through this current property, and mutating it does not trigger a re-render. This current property has nothing to do with our state variable, which also has a name of current. In fact, we will rename our current state variable to something else to avoid any confusion. We also update the initial state to use the enum of zero. You can use a switch statement to implement the state machine. The first case is operand 1. At this state, the user has three options. If the user click on the clear button, we will reset the calculator. We will declare a helper function for the reset, since we will likely reuse this reset logic. Reset will reset the expression and the current input and set the calculator back to the state of operand 1. If the user click on any operator button, to check whether a user click on the operator button, we can use a regular expression matching. We define the regular expression for the operator characters. and check if the key matches this regular expression. If it matches, we will set the expression, which is the current input plus the operator. We're adding a space between the current input and operator. Also, 
we reset the current input to zero and move the calculator to the operand to equal zero state. For all other keys, we update the operand. We create a helper function to help me generate the updated operand based on the current input and the key pressed. In this helper function, first, we handle the numeric key inputs, which are the keys between 0 and 9. There are two possibilities. If the current input is 0 or negative 0, we need to remove the 0 and replace it with whatever key is pressed. Otherwise, we add the key to the current value. Second, if the key is a dot, here we are assuming the decimal separator is a dot instead of a comma. If a dot doesn't already exist in the current input, we'll add it. Otherwise, we'll do nothing and move on. If the key is a plus minus key, and if the current input is already negative, we'll remove the negative sign. Otherwise, we'll add a negative sign to the beginning. If the key is a backspace key, we we'll remove the last character. After removing the last character, if the remaining string is either a negative sign or an empty string, we we'll add back a zero. Otherwise, we we'll return the string with the last character removed. If the key is CE, which is to clear entry, the current input should be set to zero. If the key doesn't match any of the above, we ignore it and return the current input unmodified. Going back to our handle key press callback function, we execute this get updated operand function to determine what the updated operand should be. This completes the state of operand one. Next, we'll work on the state of operand two equals zero. If the user click on the clear button, we will reset the calculator. If the user click on the equal button, we will calculate the result. We will declare a helper function called set result to update our states. In this set result function, we will first get the full calculation expression by adding the current input and the equal sign to the existing expression and separate it by spaces. We updated the react state of expression with this full expression so that it reflects on the UI. We'll skip the calculation logic for now and we'll come back to this later. For now, we'll simply set the current input to a string of result. We'll also update our calculator state to move to a state of result. We'll go back to operand two equals zero state and execute this set result function. If the user click on any operator button, we will remove the current operator from the expression and replace it with the operator the user clicked. Otherwise, we will get an updated operand based on what the key the user pressed and set it as the current input. There are two possibilities. If the updated operand is not zero, we will move the calculator state to operand two. If the updated operand is zero, we will not change the calculator state, which is in the state of operand two equals zero. Next, we will handle the state of operand two. This is very similar to the state of operand two equals zero, except we will ignore any operator keys. We will copy it from above and remove the handling of operator keys. If the updated operand ends up equal to zero, we will move the calculator to a state of operand two equals zero. Finally, we will handle the state of result. In this state, the user only has one option, which is to press the C key to clear everything shown on the calculator. 
we now have a minimally working calculator with basic user input validation. It said we wouldn't calculate the final result yet. Looks like everything works except the plus minus key and the backspace key doesn't work as what we expected. It looks like we make a mistake in the operator record expression. We will fix that. We have to restrict the operator record expression to only match a single operator, which begins and ends with the same operator. We can try again. And now it's working as we expected. If you have better ways to implement logic to handle user input for a calculator app, please let us know in the comments below. Next, we will implement the calculation logic. If you are building a web application, you will likely have a backend API. You will make a request to your API with the user input, and the backend API will then return a response. However, I will leave this for a future video. In this video, we will simply implement the calculation logic in the front end. First, we will create two calculator interfaces, one for the calculator input and the other one for the calculator result. The calculator input will have operator, operand 1 and operand 2. The calculator result will include everything in the calculator input, plus an ID, the calculation result, an error message if the result is not available, and a timestamp as an integer. We will then create a calculator surface. In this calculator service, I will export a function named calculate. It will take a calculator input and will return a calculator result. We will define all the variables we need for the calculation. We will then calculate the result for each possible operator. And then we turn the calculator result. For ID, I will generate a random integer string with a million different possible values. This should be sufficient for what we are doing, but in a real production application, we will likely have to create a new ID. For timestamp, I will use the airport timestamp for the current time. Back to your calculator component. Our calculate function takes a calculator input, but not a string of calculation expression. Therefore, we need to first convert the calculation expression to a calculator input. We'll create a helper function for this. Since the operands and operator are separated by a space, we can split them up by a space. We'll convert the operands to numbers and cast the operator string to the type of operator. We will get the calculation result by using the calculate function 
we created earlier. We update the current input to the calculation result, if available. Otherwise, we will simply display a string of error. Our calculator is now fully functional. Next, we allow users to use the calculator app through keyboard. As I mentioned earlier in this video, we need to use Event Listener to capture user inputs. Every time a user presses a key on the keyboard, it will generate a key down event. To capture this event, we can add an event listener to the document and listen for this key down event. If you simply add an event listener in the React component like this, it will cause problems. This is because every time this component is re-rendered, we add a new event listener. We end up having multiple event listeners listening for the same event. To control when we want to add event listeners to the document, we can use the use event hook. Use event hook allows our components to synchronize with external systems and execute some side effects when our component state changes. We can run some code after rendering to interact with some system outside of React, such as the DOM document. Use event is a function which takes two arguments. The first argument is a setup function. This setup function is executed at two different occasions. It is executed when this component is initially rendered and added to the DOM. It is also executed every time this component is re-rendered when the dependencies changes. We can optionally return a cleanup function from this setup function. This cleanup function is again executed at two different occasions. It is executed before each re-render. It is also executed when this component is removed from the DOM. Both the setup and cleanup functions cannot have any arguments. The second argument of use event is optional, which is a list of dependencies which control when the setup functions should be executed. There are three options for dependencies. If you don't provide anything, which means it's undefined, the setup function will be executed initially and every time this component is re-rendered. If you provide an empty array, the setup function will only be executed once initially when this component is added to the DOM. If you provide a list of dependencies, the setup function will be executed initially and every time any variable among the list of dependencies change. In the setup function, we we'll add an event listener to listen to key down event to the DOM document. The callback function to the key down event listener takes a keyboard event. This keyboard event has an attribute named key. This key attribute is a string which indicates what key has been pressed. We can execute our handle key press callback function with the key attribute in this key down callback function. If you want to know what attributes are available in the keyboard event, you can always print it out. You may attempt to use an empty array for the dependency list, thinking that we only need to register the event listener once. However, this wouldn't work. We can give it a try and see what happens. Clicking the buttons work, but as soon as we use the keyboard, everything is reset and it doesn't work as what we expected. This is because in the callback function of the key down event, it references the handle key press function. In the handle key press function, it references the expression and the current input state variables. In the initial render, the handle key press function was created with expression having a value of an empty string and current input having a value of zero. The key down callback function was created using this initial instance of the handle key press function. When the key is pressed, which triggers a render, the handle key press function was created again with different values of expression and current input. Now, we have two versions of handle key press functions. The initial version of handle key press function, which reference the initial value of the expression and current input variables. 
in the updated version of the handle keypress function, which references the updated value of the expression and current input variables. Unfortunately, because the key done callback function was never recreated with the updated handle keypress function, a key done event will ultimately trigger the initial version of the handle keypress function. To fix the issue, whenever the handle keypress function is updated, we need to deregister the key done event listener using the old function and register again with the new function. We can use the cleanup function to handle the deregistration. Therefore, in the dependency list, we will add the handle key press function as a dependency. For the key down event listener callback function, instead of using the lambda function, we will declare a name function so that we could deregister the key down event listener in the cleanup function by referencing the same key down callback function. With these changes, what's going to happen is that whenever the candle key press function changes, we will first call the cleanup function to deregister the key down event listener with the old handle keyboard event function. After we rendering, we will call the setup function, which will create a new handle keyboard event function using the updated handle key press function and register the key down event listener with this new handle keyboard event function. You may have realized that since the handle key press function is recreated on each we render, the setup function in this use event hook will be executed on every we render as well. Therefore, if you are omitting the dependency list, this use event hook will work exactly the same. Our calculator app should now work properly using keyboard. You may have to refresh the page to register the event listeners properly. The numeric keys are working, but some keys such as the backspace or enter key does not work. To fix it, we can convert the keyboard keys to the keys defined in our key enum before sending the key to the handle key press function. To see the exact key string generated in the key down event, we can examine the keyboard event object on the console. We will create a mapping for the conversion. We will use the delete key to map to the CE key, escape key to map to the C key, backspace key to map to our backspace key, and enter key to map to our equal key. We we'll ignore the plus minus key here, but feel free to use any key you want to represent the plus minus key. Back to our handle keyboard event function. We will use the map key, and if the key is not defined in our mapping, we will send the key as it is to the handle key press function. Our calculator app should now work with the keyboard for most keys. We will update the UI with CSS later, but for now, we will focus on getting the history page updated. This will be the last functional changes we are making to our calculator app. If you remember our React component tree, the history component has a list of child card components. Each card component will display the timestamp at the corner and the calculation expression with results as the main content. Let's first create this card component. This card component will have two props, a title to display the timestamp and children for we add notes to display the main content. In the history component, we will have one props, which is a list of calculation results.
we'll use the map function to create a list of card components from the list of calculation results. For the title, we'll convert the timestamp to a date object and display the date with a better string representation instead of just numbers. For the main content, we'll convert the calculation result to a string of calculation expression. We'll create a helper function for that. We extract the attributes we need from the calculation result. The expression will be operand1, operator, operand2 equals result. If result is not available, then message. And if message is not available, then simply display error. We'll create a list of mock calculation results in the app component and provide this list to the history component and see how it looks like. It looks what we expected. To dynamically display a list of calculations, based on what we actually calculated, we can declare a state variable to represent the list of calculation results. Whenever the equal button is pressed in the calculator component, we'll add the new calculation to the list of calculation results. We'll create a handler function to handle a new calculation result. Inside this function, we'll set a new list of calculation results. We'll use the function form when updating this state variable. We'll get the previous list of calculation results, and then we'll add the new calculation result to the beginning of the list. We have to pass this function down to the calculator component. In the calculator component, we we'll add a props to take this callback function. We'll name it onCalculateResult. This onCalculateResult callback function will take a calculator result and returns nothing. We we'll go to the code where the calculation is made and we'll execute the onCalculate result callback function with the calculator result. We'll then go back to the app component and pass in the handle calculate result callback function. We can try to make a few calculations and verify that the history component correctly shows all the calculations we have made. Up until now, we have implemented all the functionalities of this calculator frontend with React. Finally, we will add CSS to make the UI look a little bit more polished. React can help with CSS styling by dynamically setting the class attribute of our HTML tags. Since the main focus of this video is React, we will only use basic CSS in this video. If you are working for a production application, you may want to use some UI libraries or frameworks to handle more complicated scenarios. We we'll first clean up the placeholder text. We we'll start by changing the font. We will create a file named global.css and import it to the index.tsx file. We will select the body tag. This essentially means the entire calculator app since the React root node is a child node of the body element. We will use the font family of consolers. Next, we will work on the menu. While you could put all your CSS in one CSS file, we are going to create one CSS file for each component so that it is easier to trace back the CSS applied to each component. All the CSS will be put inside a single file during bundling, so there's really no difference either way. We're going to add a class attribute to our menu component's first div element. To add class attribute to JSX element, we have to use the attribute name class name. This is one of the differences between JSX tags and HTML tags. We are going to use a bigger font size and make it uppercase. 
also we will center it for the menu item we will remove the underline and use a black text whether the link is visited or not Also for the menu item, we add underline when the mouse is over the menu item or when the menu item is active. We also increase the offset to make it look a little bit better. We also add a vertical line between each menu item to separate each item. If there are too many items next to each other, we're going to add a vertical line just before the second menu item. This works quite well, except when the mouse is over the second menu item, the vertical line also has an underline. This is because the underline and the vertical line are both applied to the anchor link. To fix it, we can separate the text from the anchor link and apply the underline to the text portion only, and add the vertical line before the anchor link. We'll use a span tag to contain the menu item text and apply the underline to this span tag only. And now it's working properly. Another change we're going to make is that when we visit the calculator page, we want the underline to be under the calculator item. When we visit the history page, we want the underline to be under the history item. To do this, the menu component needs to know which item is selected. The information of which item is selected is actually in the app component. We can pass this information down to the menu component. We will add the props in the menu component. And pass this information down. In the menu component, if the selected item is the current item, we will add a class of menu item text underline. Otherwise, we will not add any additional class. And add this class selector to our CSS. And the underline works as what we expected. Next, we'll work on the calculator display. We add some padding, increase the height of the display, use flash display to align the items to the end, move the secondary text to the top of the display, and the main text to the bottom of the display. For the secondary display text, I will use a smaller font size and a lighter text color. For the main display text, I will use a bigger font size. We will move on to add CSS to the calculator keypad and buttons. To lay our buttons in the keypad, we will use CSS grid. We will have four columns, each column with a width of 1 FR. FR is a fractional unit, which will automatically adjust for gaps inside the grid. 
for the buttons, we will set the font to be the same as other text in the calculator app. We will use a bigger font size, add border, set the background color, and change cursor to pointer when the mouse hovers over the buttons. We also set the aspect ratio to make each button taller. It is looking better now. For the keypad buttons, we're going to use different colors for different types of keys. We can classify the buttons into three types, numeric key, the eco key, and other function and operator keys. We can add an attribute to the button props to indicate the type of keys. and use the key type to set different CSS class names. When we create the buttons in the keypad component, we can set the key type. We will create a helper function to determine the key type based on the key. Going back to the CSS for the button, we will use a darker shade for the function keys and even darker background for the eco key. We also add hover effect and use different colors when we click on the button with our mouse to make it look more like a button. Going back to the calculator component, we will set the size, add padding, margin, and gap to lay out the display and keypad. We will also add borders around the calculator. Next, we'll work on the history page. We'll start with the card component. We'll set the border, use flash display, and arrange elements in column. Set the height and background color. For the card title, which displays the timestamp, 
we'll use h3 tag instead of a div. We'll also add some margin to the title. For the main content, we'll use a bigger font size and set the margin to auto to center it in the card. Moving on to the history component. We we'll again use flash display to arrange the card components in column. Set the gap between card components. Use auto margin to center the components in the page. And set the maximum width to limit the width of the card components as the window size becomes bigger. Finally, we add some styling to the app component. I will change the empty wrapper to a div so that I could add some styling to it. We add a margin to give some space around the app. We also want to add some space below the menu header. We're going to wrap the menu component inside div element so that we could add some space below. It is time to do some final testing. The calculator app is working for the most part, except the calculation result sometimes has too many significant digits. Also, the user can input a very large number which exceeds the width of this calculator. We can limit the number of digits a user can input. Going back to the calculator component, we're going to define a limit in a constant named max digits. We're going to set a limit of 11. In the getUpdated operand function, where the operand string is created, we can modify the function to limit the operand to 11 characters. To limit the number of significant digits, we can go to the calculate function where the results are calculated and modify the significant digits of the result. We add a precision argument to the function. In the result, we'll use a numbers two position function to set the significant digits. This function returns a string and we will subsequently convert it back to a number. We we'll then go back to the calculator component and update the function call where we are calculating the result. Now the inputs and results are restricted. We can always make improvements to this calculator app, but for now, it should be sufficient for what we are doing in this video, which is to help you understand and learn front-end development with React. This is all I wanted to show you about React. And congratulations, you have made it through the end of this video. After going through this video, I hope you now have a better understanding of what React is, how React works, how to create reusable components, repeat components with array, pass information down to child components with props, add event listeners to HTML elements, manage state with use state hook, synchronize React states with external systems using use event hook, as well as how to use React to help style the UI with CSS. I hope you find this video helpful and learn something new with React today. I will post the code to my GitHub site and include a link in the description below. 
I will also include links to the websites I referenced in this video. This is the video I wanted to share with you today. If you like this video and find this video helpful, please give me a like and subscribe and share this video with others. This will give me more motivation to create new videos for you. Thank you for your support. Goodbye and see you in the next video.